Strong bodies, kind hearts, unstoppable minds. You're listening to Strong Girls Pod, where strong women share their stories to inspire strong girls. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Strong Girls Pod. I'm your host, Charlie Ekstrom, and I'm here with 2016 Olympian, pro beach volleyball player, and my coach I worked with for about five years, Lauren Fendrick. Thanks so much for coming, Lauren. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's kind of easy to introduce you when you're the crazy, awesome human that you are. But I think, you know, I gave you a little intro. I think to start off on this for our listeners, I'd love for you to kind of give like a little background, a little story time of kind of how you came to be, not just in the sport of beach volleyball, but kind of your career as an athlete, how you started up, what you did prior to beach volleyball, um, what you studied, because I know it, but people don't know how cool you are yet. (laughs) So we'd love to hear it all. Um, let's okay. hear your story. Okay. Well, you know, I'm old now, so I have a uh, quite a story or long story. I'll keep it brief. Um, <laughs> I think kind of like some of the highlights that stick out for me is I played sports with my parents from a very young age, like age three. Uh, we would play tennis together for fun on the weekends and, you know, we compete, but not it. I don't know, not really keep score. So like it was always something we did for fun. And I think I kept that mentality throughout. I played five sports in high school. I played um, two sports my freshman year at UCLA, uh, softball in addition to volleyball. Um, So I've always moved in a bunch of different ways, which I think has been helpful. Um, I've always had a really healthy shoulder, and I feel like I attribute that to softball. Uh, After UCLA, I went uh, and tried my hand at beach volleyball in 2003 that was my first year um and then last year um i guess was my last season i haven't officially retired who knows maybe i'll play a tournament at some point again but (laughs) can't get those (laughs) words out of my mouth but um yeah so played a lot on the avp and internationally for almost 20 years um squeezed in law school in the middle there and squeezed in a couple uh professional indoor or not a couple. Uh, I went to play professionally in Puerto Rico where I tore my ACL in 2005 and uh, in 2007 after I had recovered I went and played in Turkey indoor professionally. That sounds so like- a nice yeah that's a pretty cool career to say the least and then you forgot to touch up on the fact that you know there was a casual visit to the Olympics as well in there in 2016. Yeah. And then I'll just give the additional humble brag. Um, I don't have the exact stats up here, but I do recollect an AVP best blocker on tour award. Um, One of, if not the greatest blockers to come in women's beach volleyball. And on top of that, you've got pro indoor, which I actually didn't know that you played pro indoor. So that's kind of fun hearing the background now. And I love that you go, I squeaked in a law degree there. Um, Yeah, I don't know if I consider law degrees casual, but I think it's pretty awesome (laughs) that that was just like your little side project. So I think now that we've got a background, something that we do at Strong Girls when we're teaching athletic lifestyles and everyday practices, um, we like to do a lot of mindset work and we have our girls give three good things of their day every single time that we work with them so that they have a positive mindset, not only going into workshops, but so that they learn to embrace positive mindset work throughout just their everyday lives beyond when they're just working with us. So with that note, I would love to hear kind of on the note of three good things, what are your three favorite things about the sport of beach volleyball? I love that. I love that you do that with your, your girls. Um, beach volleyball. Oh, it's so easy to love. Um, Probably number one, you're outside sometimes near water. That's an added bonus. Ocean. Love the ocean. Um, Second, no substitutions, um, which really can force you to kind of like go to the depths of your mind because if you're struggling, you're going to get targeted. There's no, there's no way out. You can call time out, but, um, (laughs) and then third, I think, uh, working with a teammate towards a common goal. 
I love that. I couldn't agree anymore. You know, being a beach volleyball player, I have to agree that being near the ocean is kind of just an added advantage of playing this sport. Training. Yeah. It's easy. Just a nice little swim. No need for an ice bath when you can just hop in the water. It's great. (laughs) Um, And then I think on that same note, we've heard your three favorite parts of playing sport, but obviously you had played sports beyond beach volleyball. What are your three favorite pieces of being an athlete in general? Hmm. This one I might need to think about. I feel like I'd give you a different answer each time you ask me, but for sure on there would be getting to focus on self-improvement. I love waking up every morning, setting an intention for how I'm going to get better that day, and then kind of circling back. I love that cycle. Um, and I think that's why I have such a hard time saying I'm done, I'm retired, because you know I don't want to stop doing that, which I don't have to, but... Um, as your job, that's pretty sick. Uh, yes. I think the competition aspect also, so then you get, you have a proving ground that is so safe, you know, like you get to go out there and put into play what you've been working on and just kind of be yourself. It's always been a safe space for me, so I love competing. Um, I only have those two right now. I like those two, and I agree that getting to wake up and have your job be finding bits of self-improvement, but also being able to translate it into life beyond sport. It's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool aspect of professional athletics. Um, and then I think something that we've also, again, I feel like it's easy for me to talk to you about these things because not only do I know you in the scope of, we know we play the same sport. So it's fairly easy to talk all day about beach volleyball, but something that I've gotten to learn from you, not as a coach in, is kind of pre-game rituals, post-game rituals, mid-game rituals. And I feel like that's a huge piece of sport, but also a huge piece of beach volleyball. And I'd love you to either walk through your pre, post, mid-game rituals from when you played or even in your role as a coach, kind of what that's been like adjusting back and forth or kind of teaching how to slow things down or what are your rituals like in coaching and or playing? Yeah. Um... I'm trying to remember all of them, but it's definitely evolved uh, throughout my career and changed probably even season to season. I feel like on the road, there's a whole like, you know, wake up, move right away, make sure you're getting fueled, hydrating. I mean, that starts even before that. Video preparation. I'm a huge video watcher. I would watch, try to watch at least six matches of the team we're playing um, if I could if that was available and if I had the time. There's sometimes back-to-back situations or you don't know who you're going to play, limiting factors. Getting faster than game speed, so working into that, obviously, like starting with feeling out your body with your warm-up and then making sure I'm always getting a sweat, getting faster than game speed, getting dirty, making sure that in-game is not the first time my heart rate is, like, above, you know, the threshold and um, it's not the first time I'm like max jumping or max sprinting feeling out the conditions and then trying to connect with my partner get on the same page um, make sure we have a game plan that's simple and executable and that we both agree on yeah I guess that's the gist of it and then I'd say think during the game something I really enjoyed doing was keeping my thinking to between plays and making sure that once I stepped into serve receive that I was completely just playing the situation present um so for me like I would kind of say like a little phrase little white ball even though the ball is not white anymore (laughs) that was always my phrase to kind of like just keep me present um And making sure I was seeing what was happening and not trying to like pre-decide or use any sort of like predictive type analysis like, oh, she cuts a lot or, oh, this is what I think might happen. Um, Just trying to be really open and um, athletic within the play. Um, I love that. And I feel like thinking of that as a player, thinking of that in the scope of like any game of just like being living in the present moment, especially in volleyball, I feel like is such a fun piece of the sport that I had a huge, a huge growth point when I started playing more in the present moment. And I feel like that was in part to you, but also just like a piece of that in like learning and playing and 
even like developing as an adult is like living more in the present moment. Because if you think too much about the past or the future, you're just bogged down instead of actually being able to move at full speed. And I don't know, I feel like looking at life, volleyball is a good like little serve of presence in life because you have to be present in volleyball. So it almost like forces you to live in the present moment when you're in life as well. Yeah, totally. And now I fully interrupted you so we can go to post game rituals now. I was now. kind of rambling anyway. I but... loved it. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I think joy was another thing that I like struggled to try and find within uh, playing. I think for most of my career, I was kind of like a perfectionist type of like, I'm going to get the muscle memory to do this shot or this play or do everything perfectly every time. And that was always my goal. And it wasn't until pretty late in my career where someone was talking to me about joy. I was working with a sports psychologist and um, it was really hard for me. And in the beginning, I even just was like, joy, like, doesn't, that's not going to get you points. Like, who cares? Like me being analytical and perfect and technical is going to get me points. So it even took me a while to like buy in and, um, it's not something that comes naturally to me. So celebrating was something I forced myself to try and do, um, even though I probably <laughs> am not seen as like a big celebrator. Um, I blame it on my voice. It's like very like under the radar tone <laughs> or something. Um, you've become, it's funny that you say that because I feel like you've become such a bigger celebrator as a coach than I saw <laughs> when I would watch you play of like, you'll get excited and rallied up. You're like, yeah. And it almost motivated us as players. Marks were like, oh my goodness, Lauren is pumped up right now. Let's get excited because Lauren is pumped up and we don't necessarily get to see her like That's outwardly so excitement, but it used That's to funny. fire us up. I remember it was awesome. Yeah. 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 Too task oriented. There's good and bad in all of it. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's Always. cool, like piecing it together, but like forcing a smile. Sometimes I remember, goodness, we used to talk about it of like the fake it to you make it like slap a smile on your face to find the joy in it. Cause if you put it on there long enough, like at some point it's going to change your emotions. And I love that. Like there's a huge piece to that of, and I like, I like kind of moving in the direction of like talking about you being like a very task oriented individual, what kind of drove you in sport? Like what was your biggest driver in sport that kind of moved beyond just like task oriented? Was it task completion? Was it a goal oriented? But like, I'd love to hear kind of what made you tick. What was the biggest driving factor for you in playing sport in kind of working towards the levels that you played at throughout various years and points in your career? I think it started like sports were a safe space for me. I felt really comfortable and like the ability to, you know, be myself and just be really safe to try new things, to um, compete. And it grew into like, oh, okay, like I'm okay at this. Like, so then kind of seeing like, how good can I get at this? Um, and uh, being an alternate, I think for the 2012 Olympics and with Brooke Niles, um, I, that was like surprising to me. Like we were the 10th ranked team in the world and, um, you know, missed out on country quota going to London. And I was like, wow, oh, uh, maybe, maybe I should try for the Olympics. Um, so for the next four years, that was my complete and utter focus. And it was the first time that I didn't have another job, um, that I really could put everything, every ounce of myself into beach volleyball. And I really did that in every single way. Yeah. Not to that's... say I would do things differently. If I <laughs> knew then what I knew now, but um, that's kind uh -huh. of how that evolved. Um, yeah. I think also, sorry, one more thing. I have to mention no, my, she, like she'll do the most mundane, like boring tasks and like never complain. And like all these like complex things, like my, both my parents were very like do it yourself type people. Like they didn't really hire people to like fix the cars or like fix things. Like they always were like, okay. So like one day I came downstairs, I think I was like 10 and my mom had taken apart the TV um, when it was like these old like tube TV TVs and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm fixing the TV. So like just seeing people who are like willing to do things for themselves and like 
not complain about the hard, boring things kind of created that subconsciously in me. So I was always willing to do the work. It was always something that came very naturally to me. And I attribute that to the example set by yeah. my parents. Doing the little bit of grunt work. I can't believe that she took apart, like just would take apart the TV. I do. Just, yeah. She yeah. all the stuff at her house now, like, that's like, so cool. And I feel like that's a really cool setting of your mom was a do it yourself. Like she set a really cool precedent for you of being able to put in the grunt work so that the end result was really pretty. Even looking at that little bit of a TV example of like, this is a bunch of pieces of parts and parts that I took apart and put together to have a really cool result. Like, let's go watch a movie on the thing that I just built and put together. And I mean, serving it as like a tiny little example of something that could lead to much bigger of, hey, I put in that extra five minutes at a volleyball practice and it's going to translate to I'm going to be the best passer on tour or I'm going to be able to win way more games because I'm way more confident instead of just dancing around the idea of, oh, it'll come, but you're willing to put in the work so that it'll come because you put in the work instead of just waiting for something to happen. Or at least I tried to be as best I could be. Just nose to the grindstone always so that you could be the best you could be, which is such a cool, such a cool process. Um, okay. I'm thinking back also beach volleyball wise. What is your favorite element to play in? Like, what's your favorite? Do you like it to be flat, calm? Do you like a little bit of wind, cloudy, hot? hot you like hot? Hot, hot and, humid. and humid? Yeah. That I don't is know the why I do really well. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm old and I don't have to warm up as much. That's I've always fair. acclimated really quickly to, to heat. I love I love heat because my joints feel really good in the heat, but that's a crazy answer. The humidity comment. I played in snow once in Moscow. You played in, in snow? Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too much of a weather wimp to I ever handle snow. snow volleyball. Yeah, no, it just happened. It was beach volleyball with snow. <laughs> but I was prepared. Oh. I had some wool items. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. You're like, yeah, I love the heat and humidity, but also I've played in the snow, not purposefully. Like snow. Yeah, I can't say that it sounds like one that I would have enjoyed. There's there's another beach volleyball thing. What is your favorite like point to get? I feel like looking at like, like a kill or a block or an ace. What's your favorite point and why? I have my answer. I know that like my pattern is that I like to, like I hit pretty hard and I serve pretty decently, but my favorite thing to get is a block. Cause yeah. it just feels like it's so much harder to do. And so when yeah. you do it, it just feels so awesome. Like what was your favorite thing? Like of like something that was the most rewarding feeling? Probably a block. I mean, yeah, getting blocks is really, it has to be a terminal block, obviously. But, yeah. Yeah. that's a Terminal blocks. I feel like there's something about terminal blocks that just like, they just feel just like they make you feel warm inside almost a little bit. I don't do it very often, but I feel like also digging heat is like oh. transitioning it. It's got to feel, feel pretty good. Yeah, that's probably got to be pretty comparable to like blocking heat. Like when they when they hit one so hard that you're like, I have no idea how I just did that. But that result was so pretty, like just so awesome and so difficult to do, like so underrated. I feel like blocking when you watch it looks so much easier than it actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's the people, I mean, for you, I know that you put in all the work as we were just talking about it, but I remember watching and trying to pick it up at first and I was like, this blocking thing is so hard and looks so much easier than it is. I was like, <laughs> I'm around way too many people who make blocking look too natural. Like this is so difficult for me. So no, you're now, a good blocker. Now, <laughs> that was not to start though. I just was, I just could jump high. <laughs> but put in the grunt work, as you were saying, the little pieces, even just like, for me, I feel like the thing that was really hard for me was literally learning to get my thumbs involved or like tilt my wrists. I was just always like, my mom used to call it spoon hand. I'd go up like, she's like, oh, you just blocked so daintily there. <laughs> um, Thanks mom. Yeah, I was like, thank you so much. I don't think I want any of my game to be described as dainty. And she goes, <laughs> yeah, maybe that wasn't the right word. Um, but then I was like, let me get in it. Let's grab the, let's grab it. Let's go for it. And it just felt so much Actually, more rewarding. I, I take that back. Winnie a joust. Oh, oh, I didn't even think about that. That is cause that one is like almost personal too. When you win a joust. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Tooling is oh. pretty. 
Yeah, those are fun. Oh, wow. There's a lot of really rewarding plays in volleyball. Now that I'm thinking about it, the sport that we play, it's pretty cool. <laughs> you get to touch the ball like almost probably every play. I know. That's, that's the appeal. Back to the three favorite things of the sport. No substitutions. We get to play it all. It's that's pretty cool. Right. Awesome. Um, and then looking at beach volleyball, you were talking kind of a little bit about your journey in professional sport, in your journey to the Olympics. Um, I know that a huge piece of that, and you were even talking about in your pregame ritual, like getting on the same page as your partner. Partnerships come in such a high factor with beach volleyball. I know it, you know it. How does partnership chemistry come in for you? How did you choose your partners? Um, what was kind of the mindset going in? What type of partner did you like working with most? I know that's something that we use a lot is like emotions or steady players. Um, do you like big energy? Do you like low energy? How did you choose them? What was the vibe you were looking for? Yeah, I again, I think it like evolved throughout my career. And obviously, you only have one part of the like, you don't always just get to pick. <laughs> so yes. sometimes, you know, someone's picking you. And so I think, uh, knowing what I know now, like definitely some but definitely energy is more important than I realized and not that I would pick a partner based on energy but like someone's gonna have to create the energy if you're both pretty like even um I mean you don't have to it's not necessarily gonna win points but like with Brooke Sweat and me we both were pretty like fairly quiet even though she's like she's fiery um I had to celebrate more um and maybe that was actually for my own get up like I had to like spend the extra energy even though I felt like I needed to conserve energy I remember spending a conscious effort trying to celebrate points and it actually helped even though I like did not think that it would um but yeah complementing strengths and weaknesses um I really liked playing with people who you could get really detailed uh game planning with um Ashley Ivy was the first person that I, well, I don't know if she's the first person I played with that was like really technical uh, or analytical, but um, I like playing with people who want to be very like situational with game. I think game plan is my, one of my favorite things to do. I loved, I loved sitting in games and you'd be like, you want to make a game plan right now? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> let's do it. Um but that's so cool. Like somebody that could be more analytical with you, I feel like. But it's is... not always the best fit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you don't want to be too similar sometimes. So I don't know if I have a great answer for it. I was always trying to play with the best person I could play with. So best side out, best defense. Um, and I would, I don't think in the, in the beginning of my career, I wouldn't call those people who I thought like weren't going to play with me. And then as I started realizing like, oh, you know, so-and-so almost played with me. Like, what if I would have reached out and said something? Like, would they have changed their mind? Um, so, yeah, I think for advice for younger people, like definitely call those people that you don't think are going to play with you and let them say no. It's okay to hear no, um, but it's not okay to, you know, not ask and just also ask in a respectful way <laughs> don't just like text like hey you want to play and blah blah blah, blah. yeah <laughs> like that's like, fair i don't know yeah test it out see like hey maybe can we get into practice first instead of just hey this is out of the blue but want to go or, like, do make a whatever. case of why they would want to play with you or you know say something with some like, sort of that you understand like fight them or for yourself at or have the same yeah. goals or there's always a conversation of like, what are your goals? Like that, um, I think too, is something that I didn't necessarily talk about uh, early on in my career. And then, you know, uh, later in my career, it was always like, okay, are we aligned in our goals or, um, or not? And that's definitely uh, something you gotta be in an alignment or one or both people aren't gonna be happy. Yeah, I feel like a huge piece, like what you were just saying too is, aligning your goals and outline them in order to put up a fight, like fight for yourself a little bit, learn to be confident and encourage yourself in your own ways so that then you can build from there or establish a relationship or partnership or anything from there, which I love. I don't know if I've ever thought of it in that way of learning to fight for yourself that like boosts yourself up. 
Um, how do you think that that has translated into your personal life? You were talking about how a huge piece of being a pro athlete is like every morning you get to wake up and think of a way to be better. How does that translate from like an athletics perspective into more of like a life perspective for you? I know that like you're still obviously involved in athletics, but I feel like kind of shifting from day to day. Like I represented myself for my entire career, except for one year that I had Tim Peterson, awesome agent. So I had to get comfortable talking about myself. I had a really hard time with that, but you know, no one else was going to, you know, speak about me if, if I didn't. So there was no choice. Um, so I think getting comfortable speaking about yourself in a honest, but also confident and like I have value here and you know, it, it can be an uncomfortable thing. I think especially as a woman to just, yeah, say I have value and, um, you should hire me or sponsor me for these reasons. And just being, just presenting it like that. I feel like looking like at the long list of things that you've done in your career and like all that you've done with the sport. Do you have any moments like specific moments? It could be one, it could be a couple, but like specific times that you would consider the highlight of your career or like highlights of your career that you're like, this is my like favorite thing to think back on and like in memory. It's a hard one. I feel like there were so many highs and so many lows just personally for me definitely uh getting second at world champs was big making the olympics was big winning my first tournament was big uh coming back and playing after i had kids that was cool <laughs> having them get to watch one game the kiddos <laughs> it's still crazy to me that i mean it was awesome and i feel like something that was so huge feel like you got to serve as a really cool role model for a lot of us in college but just like in the sport in general the women who choose to have kids and continue their sport beyond I feel like in beach volleyball like there was like almost the idea that you couldn't quite do that it was like kids put on pause the only person who had ever really like had kids during their career and come back from it was Carrie Walsh Jennings and I feel like you and a handful of others like started to kind of give a really good example of that. And I don't know if you have given yourself enough props to that, but you've just served as a very good role model um, in that process. Definitely something that needs to be supported more just parents in general and being so in it right now, or the parents who are in it, like you just, you're just trying to survive. And when you have young kids, Honestly, the support system is awful. So I hope that that changes, but it's not looking <laughs> like it will. <laughs> um, but yeah, I never thought about it before now. So hopefully. Has being a parent, like not just, obviously we just talked about it affecting your like perspective as an athlete, looking at it as a, co as a coach or like even as a coach prior to kids and post kids, like, have you ever considered your players to be kind of like your kids or like kind of like 100%. in the moment? 100%. Oh yeah. We yeah. You guys are all like I mean, obviously you have your own parents, but um I think that's the the lens through which I see a lot of it is like how would I want my kid to be treated by their coach if she was their age in that transitional period in life? Like I feel such a reverence for the position that we're in. Um to be such big pieces, or I mean, even small pieces of your guys' lives um, during college, which I know for me was like super transitional and it's a little different for everybody, but um, I went through a lot of changes and a lot of exploration and hard times. And, um, you know, I think trying to be just a solid person that is safe is really important. And that's what I try to do. And, and hopefully that, you know, is the case. I love it. We used to call you, there were a couple of times where like when you would fight for calls for us, we called you mama bear, Lauren, we, or we'd be like, <laughs> Lauren's going in mama bear mode for us right now. And we love it. <laughs> it was awesome. I love that you see it as that perspective too, because we felt it like that presence is felt. Um, and I feel like from a coaching perspective, when you're a parent, when you're a coach, and when you're also a player, like you had a really unique perspective for all of us. Cause you kind of saw it through three different lenses. 
all at once. Like it just made us feel that much closer and also developed a sense of trust in players. And I think that that was a very cool piece of it all of when you're establishing that trust with players. Did you ever have that with a coach? I don't know if if it was something that you learned from a coach or if it just kind of came with time where you're like, I played this sport. This is what I would have wanted. I would have, I have my daughter now. This is what I want her to experience. Is that where it came from? Or did you have any examples or role models kind of like leading up to it all? I mean, for yelling at referees. (laughs) (laughs) Not for yelling at referees, just for coaching in general. (laughs) Hopefully there's some referees that will listen to this and, you know, give me a little, cut me a little slack. (laughs) Players want it. The players are asking for it. The players love it. They're they're fully asking for it. (laughs) I mean, so a bunch of things come to mind. Like in terms of like the parent role, my parents never pushed me into in 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 my sports careers um and that was huge i had such a safe space to kind of explore and actually the one sport that my dad did kind of like get involved a little bit with was basketball and you know i ended up hating basketball so (laughs) it's a common story that you hear but I, i can see from this perspective you just want the best for your kid and you you got to go about it in a way that you know they're the person driving the uh, passion and the motivation or it's not going to work. Like you just can't put that ahead of anything else. So it's mostly keep my mouth shut a lot (laughs) because like (laughs) there's things that I want to do this way that I want you to do this way. But it's like, if you don't want to do it that way, then it doesn't even matter. Like we're just going to be butting heads and um, it's more important for it to come from you, um, from the player than uh, for me to satisfy whatever, you know, I think is your potential or whatever. And maybe that's a deeper conversation um, for later, but um, yeah, it's got to come from the athlete. Awesome. I think going back career side, um, you had talked about like kind of some highs and lows in sport. And I know like lows in sport, I feel like are the thing that are starting to get talked about more. but I feel like a huge piece with strong girls is finding ways to be strong even through the lows. Did you have any moments that you could like really establish as maybe even lowlights is what I'd call them? Like not just the highlights. We know that there's a lot of glory in sport, but there's a lot less glory than people realize. Did What was kind of like your biggest challenge? Did you have any times where you were thinking like, what if I just stopped doing this altogether? Or like any moments where the doubt kind of crept in and made the sport a lot less fun. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of moments like traveling, you know, the entire summer, you miss so much uh, going on with family and friends. Um, So there were definitely hard moments, um, but I never quitting was something that never crossed my mind. Um, like it was a choice for me. Like I wanted to be where I was doing what I was, but yeah, I think the biggest challenge in my career or one of, one of the biggest challenges was handling my, my knee had, you know, a pretty degraded knee for my entire career. And so I was constantly doing maintenance, prehab, rehab, recovery modalities modifications trying to change my game in a way that like it didn't become you know a gaping hole of serve me to my left like you know like there's a lot of extra work that I had to do every single day to play so that's the thing like the work has never been the issue for me but I don't have time or the financial resources to do that (laughs) but yeah, that, that was, I think, the biggest challenge for me. And then, like, losing was always hard, but it was always an opportunity to get better and to go back and look and what, what can we do different and, like, just get back to the drawing board. Um, and I lost a lot. You know, I lost more than I won, probably. And I, you know, continued setting goals and continued, you know, trying to work through... Uh, my process, which I would totally rehaul knowing now what I know, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I don't know. The lows kind of make the highs. So like if you didn't have lows, you wouldn't have highs. So 
it's all it's all a big game with peaks and valleys. And... Always, no matter what you're doing, if you're staying at home and not competing, you're going to have lows. Like if you're working, you're going to have lows. If you're, you know, in the best relationship of your life, you're going to have lows. Like you're not going to avoid that ever. So I don't know if it, it would never really discourage me. I love it. If you were to look back, like, did you have mindset pieces of like when you hit that low, like what is a mindset that you would kind of like enter if you're in that low, is it just kind of get back to the grindstone or is it, there's going to be a high that is matched with this? Like what was your mindset when you knew, when you were able to acknowledge that you were in a time that was probably a lower piece in sport or in life in general, um, what kind of motivated you to get yourself out of it or to keep working in order to get yourself out of it? I mean, there must have been belief. It wasn't like a conscious, I would need some time to process and I wouldn't try to, you know, wallow in it too much. Um, you know, maybe I would talk to my sports psych if I needed to like process something specific about that match, about the partnership, about whatever I felt. Maybe I, you know, got really tight or anxious or whatever. Um, but eventually I would get to a point where it's like, okay, like, here's something I can get better at so that won't happen in the future. Or, you know, no guarantee that things don't happen because you just don't, you can't control whether you win or lose, but you get to go out there and you get to compete again and you get to see if it makes a difference and you get to see if you get tight again under that situation. So I think that that, that hunger of like, I can get better, so I'm going to keep playing. So it's almost like the low fueled me to, you know, get back to the practice, get back to the next competition and see if I could make some changes. That genuinely just gave me goosebumps yeah. hearing that. Um, just hearing that the low like fueled was the motivator. I think that that's such a, such a cool message, hopefully for every person listening right now. Like that's such a cool message of that. Even if you're in the middle of a low point, like let that serve as fuel, let that serve as something that can motivate you to drive forward instead of wallowing, like allow yourself the time to process it, but let it serve as a motivational piece to your life. Instead of just saying, I'm in a low and I don't know what to do. I'm in a low and I believe that this low is there for a reason. I, I love that. Like that. It I, it always exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> <It's>, oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's one of these things that like having these conversations with everybody is going to be awesome in like part for me, because as an athlete too, I'm also going through these highs, these lows, like all of the trials and tribulations of sport. And I think it's a really cool opportunity to hear from people, even to hear from you and learn from you beyond the scope of like, I knew you as my coach, we were, we've worked together for five years and I'm still getting the chance to learn so much more about the pieces of what kind of got you, like what were the building steps to move forward? It's awesome. You're very sweet. <laughs> I'm just sitting here just smiling the whole conversation because it's so fun to learn. Oh, I have a really good question. This is actually, these are the, a couple of these I've inserted questions from our girls, from strong girls. What leadership opportunities have you had in your sports career and could be outside of sport as well, but what leadership opportunities have you had and how have they benefited you both in sport and out of sport? Um, yeah, there have been quite a few. I was the female athlete representative for the FIV for I think four years. Um, oh, it was so hard. It felt so hard to affect change and took up so much time, but um, I was really passionate about it and oh, I tried to do my best. But um, I did some representation for USAV, um, like same thing, player rep type stuff. Um, I was on the governance committee for USA Volleyball for a short stint. Um, coached the NTDP for a long time, like most of the holiday camps throughout my uh, career, playing career. Um, got to coach um, lots of lots of people. That was always something that I really enjoyed. Do you think that in the period of time where you were serving as a female athlete um, advocator and all of that in USA Volleyball, in FIVB, in all of that, do you think that like translated in your like leadership skills and like times as a coach, like at all, like where when you became an advocate, 
off the court as a player, like how did that kind of like translate in your time as a coach? I guess perspective, I got to see, you know, things from the kind of admin point of view and behind the scenes and see what goes into, or at least the aspects that I was shown for the different organizations. Um, And also just like how difficult really it was to affect change and the different forces at bay. Um, Yeah, it was super interesting. I think seeing it through through a bigger lens of, uh, you know, pushing forward a, a female sport that you know, can pave the way for generations to come, building upon what people have built on before. Um, And in that vein, like I also have worked with Anne Mother, which is an organization that's trying to promote the sustainability of being a mom and an athlete um, and a career person and, uh, you know, not just having to be just a mom. Um, Not that you can't just be a mom because that is a full, more than a full-time job. (laughs) <laughs> um, want to do that, but not being limited if you don't want to be limited. Absolutely. Like you're this and this, you're a person and all of the cool things that you do, not so much, or I but love having it. the support systems in place. So that's, that's possible. Cause it just, it's so freaking hard, um, right now. And it's way easier than, you know, it's been for generations before us. And I also am privileged to have a ton of support and help. And it's still freaking hard. Like, you know, we're just surviving. And yeah, there really is not enough support in place right now. Yeah, agreed. (laughs) I think I did want to hit you with our outro with our following Um, For those who are unfamiliar with Strong Girls United, we follow a three-pillared piece of existence. and Our motto is to have strong bodies, kind hearts, and unstoppable minds. And I think that a huge piece of being on this Strong Girls pod, talking to these strong women, I wanted to ask you, Lauren, first off, how is your, what is your favorite way and how do you keep your body strong? I think I go to like the, I don't know if it's five pillars, but it's like, just like sleep, movement, hydration, uh, connection, relaxation, like make sure physiology is, is working well. So that's how I keep my body strong. I love it. That's awesome. And sleep, sleep and hydration were pieces that came later underrated. to learn. Underrated. And they're so underrated and so important. I feel like people forget. Next up, this is my favorite one that I'm so excited to hear the answers to is how do you keep your heart kind? How do you keep your heart kind? Empathy. I love it. Empathy. I love it. And then last and most certainly not least, maybe the most important of it all, how do you keep your mind unstoppable? How do you keep your mind unstoppable? Belief. Belief in yourself. Belief in others. You know, you gotta you gotta risk it for the biscuit. Yes, you do have to risk it for the biscuit. I feel like too, you kind of, I feel like you have the definition of an unstoppable mind of, I don't even know, like to chat with you as somebody who has like a very racing mind as well, um, who thinks about a lot of things all the time, like learning to find stopping points so that your mind never really stops in the long run. Um, I love it. Like the belief and the consciousness of I'm going to get this done. I'm going to do it. And I know that I'm capable. Like, so I love that. Yeah. I'm so honored that you reached out to me as your guest. And it's always been such a pleasure to uh, just connect with you and um, be a part of your life for the last five years. So um, I'm really excited to see what you do. Oh, thanks, Lauren. You're the best. you for taking the time to join us today on strong girls pod in the spirit of growing community and inspiring strong girls and women everywhere please subscribe rate and leave a comment about our podcast tell your friends family really everyone to listen in and enjoy this podcast is sponsored by strong girls united a nonprofit with a mission to empower girls to be strong confident and resilient through sports mentorship and mental health programming 
Visit sgunitedfoundation.org to learn more on how you can get involved today.